So peaceful it's uh, start today. This is lecture 11. So just to quickly recap, uh, in the last couple of classes, we have been looking at the idea of uh, n-path operation. And the uh, basic goal was to reduce the number of frequency translations that happen in an LPTV network. And the principle behind the n-path was the following, we take the LPTV network at FS and uh, in all the networks that we have considered, the uh, periodicity comes from the periodically operated switches. So let us say the controls are pi of t. We have uh, multiple copies of the same LPTV network. Just that the time variance in each network is shifted by equal amounts. And in this case, the controls to the switches, they all shifted. And for the nth system, it will be this one. You feed in the same input, and then you sum up all the outputs. And when we do that, only frequencies of the form f plus k times nfs will fold back to f at the out, right? And uh, yeah, and see in the circuits we have seen, uh, we have been dealing only with periodically operated switches. But let us say you have uh, an LPTV network where a resistance or a capacitance that is varying periodically with time. In that case, in the delayed LPTV network, you make sure that the variation in the resistance is delayed. Right? For example, uh, if you think about it, we had cases like this, right? We had a resistor and a switch. So this entire thing, and let's say this is operated at phi of t. So this entire thing, you can uh, think of it as one single resistor. This values are. So you can consider that this entire box acts like one resistor, whose resistance is, uh, how does the resistance change? It's R, R infinity, right? So this is one periodically varying resistor again, right? And uh, just if you shift the clock to this, even this variation in the resistance will just get shifted in there, okay? And we saw how to use this n path principle and uh, we uh, use the, I mean, we use this to derive the multiphase buck converter. And in the last class, we saw how we can use it to reduce the frequency translations in uh, chopping. So again, if we have two choppers like this, where each of them is operated at FS, the overall network from the input to the output, what is the frequency at which uh, it varies periodically? 2 times Fs, right? So only frequencies of the form uh, F plus K times 2 Fs will fold to F. And we saw we can uh, reduce this by doing n path chopping. And in this also we saw two particular cases at the end. So if you choose an odd value of n, say n equal to 3, what will be the overall frequency at which the network varies periodically? 6fs, right? So it becomes 6fs, so which means f plus k times 6fs will only fall to f. But if you choose an even value of n, say n equal to 4, what was the periodicity? It was only 4fs. Okay, so which means f plus k times 4fs will fall to f. So if you had to use the same path chopping, you might be better off using an odd value of n. And also we saw how uh, we can treat uh, time intelligent ADCs also as an n path operation. So in this class, we will look at the other LPTV network that uh, we had discussed. And what was that? Yeah, the bandpass filter, right? So let's quickly uh, brush up that. And if you recollect, the way we derived it was the 
the following. So we assume that we have a narrow low pass filter. What we did was we modulated the input signal by a periodically varying square wave and the output was again modulated. Right? And uh, the initial circuit that implemented this exact block diagram was this. We have two switches here. capacitor and then you have, I will just show it as P of T, although when you finally implement it will also have these switches. And then we saw that uh, we can improve upon this and uh, that is when we ended up with this final network where we got rid of uh, this bottom switch and uh, this was the final band pass filter that we had. right? And please note uh, this circuit does not implement this fellow. Okay. So, these two are not equal. right? So, uh, this one is basically this, but this is a modified circuit. Right? Great. And I mean uh, for this network, if let us say the uh, value of resistor is R and uh, capacitor is C, what would be the single sided bandwidth for the bandpass filter? Let us say this is 5152. For this one, 1 by RC, right? Whereas for uh, this network, it depended, it depended on the uh, duty cycle. If the duty cycle was D, the single sided bandwidth was D by RC, right? That is one direct difference you can see. Okay, and uh, let us make product again. C and let us assume uh, this is also P of T, P of T and this has a duty cycle of T. So, if I were to sketch uh, H 0 of J 2 pi F, the magnitude of this. So, here what is the input frequency and output frequency? Input is F, I am observing the same frequency F at the output. And uh, we saw that this had multiple pass bands, so around DC, we will have say one around FS, one around 2 FS, 3 FS and so on. Okay. Okay. And please take a look uh, in the circuits that we had considered, we did not have a Banded 2 fs because the square wave had 50 percent duty cycle. Okay. If for a general duty cycle of B, we will have the bands around every multiple of fs. Okay. And uh, the single sided bandwidth we know it is D by RC. Okay. And uh, let us say finally you are only interested in uh, this band. What you could uh, end up doing is you could probably put a narrow bandpass filter, not a narrow. A sloppy bandpass filter that does something like this. Okay, and uh, this is okay because the FS frequency in practice that will be of the order of gigahertz, right? So designing a bandpass filter that has that can attenuate, uh, you know, frequencies beyond uh, two gigahertz. Let's say this one, this will be two and three, right? This might be okay, and. Uh, the fact that the strength of the pass bands at higher frequencies keeps reducing also helps our cause. Right? So, finally you could probably do this, you could have an MPI bandpass filter and this need not be very sharp, right? this can do a, this can have a very you know slopey uh, response, this will not go to the negative. And after this you could have our LPTV bandpass filter. And the sharp pass band that we are getting through this LPTV. Let us say bandwidth. Okay. It is narrow bandwidth. Is it okay? okay. But uh, this being an LPTV network, we will uh, we'll again have 
the effects of frequency translation and uh, again f plus kfs will put f and this is particularly a problem because uh, the main application of this filter was to be used in wireless receivers where you need very sharp bandpass filters and let's say uh, this is the spectrum and this is your desired signal now our band, uh, bandpass filter has a very sharp or narrow bandwidth so let us say if there is some uh, blocker that is next to it it could easily filter it out right because our bandwidth was also very narrow but let's say this is f we know that even a uh, frequency at f plus fs and f plus 2fs they can all fold back to f right so you could have some other you no know, uh, signals here they can all actually fold back to s okay now uh, although we have this bandpass filter up front this might not be good enough to attenuate these strong uh, blocks blockers okay so finally you will find that uh, signals around these frequencies they can all fold back to s right and of course we might want, we, do, we want to reduce the number of such down conversions and uh, that's where we uh, use the idea of in path so let's see uh, how we can do that so i'll consider a case where the duty cycle is half so uh, this is the first copy i'll have the resistor switch and the capacitor and you have multiplication with t of t and uh, let us say this is also p of t and we will have one more copy where the time variance is basically t s by n and you will have let us say n of them in uh, parallel and then finally you will have to sum up everything right so let us say this is Ah. Okay. Uh, our LPTV bandpass filter has multiple passbands, right? We also this filters around FS. It also filters around 2FS, 3FS, and so on. No, no. This is different. See, this we are considering an input at F and an output at F. That is that's what this response is. right so if we have a frequency around 2fs the bandpass filter will still allow it the lptv bandpass filter right if my input is at a frequency say 2fs the bandpass filter will still allow it and at the output you will see it at 2fs that is this problem the uh, frequency i mean the uh, this is something different right this is some frequency in at the input at f plus fs but if you look at the output spectrum you will have all of these falling down so input of the input will only this three people no input will have the entire spectrum right i mean in this case i am considering uh, these yeah we are putting bandpass filter right at the uh, input side of the input right so that these three frequencies uh, fs to fs to fs are considering so these three people should be the input of the input no no it, uh, i mean see the bandpass filter will uh, give some attenuation okay so but that might not be good enough so finally at here you will find all of these they might be attenuated slightly for example this might not look like this it might be slightly attenuated but still they are very significant because the signal that you might be interested in uh, filtering you know this that could have a very small strength right so you might have signals around f plus fs f plus 2 fs f plus 3 fs and so on and they can all potentially alias back to f at the end and the end path will solve only this problem right. yeah so this is the uh, 
this is how we might construct uh, you know multiple parts and uh, if i were to sketch p of t i assume a duty cycle of half so let's say it looks like this the second is uh, shifted by say some ts by n and the nth clock might have put something like this okay Now we know how to implement uh, this portion. Just a couple of switches. So finally, we'll have to do this summation also. So it's not very trivial, okay? But uh, just as in the case of uh, multi-phase buck converters, where we chose some special values like say d equal to half and n equal to two, we had some nice things happening there. So it turns out here also we'll have something uh, nice happening. So let's see what happens here. So this just a two-path filter. So I'll have this fellow. See, this is clocked at five one. At the output, I'll draw the switches here. So this is five one and five two. So what will be the clocks here? This will be delayed version of phi one, and in this case, I will say it's just phi. So this is phi two and phi one, and of course, I have to sum them. Right, and uh, one crucial difference here is the following: if you sketch the clockwise forms, phi one will look like this. And phi two will be exactly the complement of this, right? So the key difference is that the clocks are non-overlapping, right? Whereas uh, in the previous case, you see that at this point, multiple clocks are active, so there is some overlap between the clock faces. So what that translates is the following. So uh, here, because of the uh, reason that we have non-overlapping clocks, the two circuits we have here, their operation is also non-overlapping, right? That is, uh, when the top circuit here, when the switch is on, the resistor is connected to the capacitor. But in that phase, this switch is open, and here, the resistor is not connected to the capacitor, right? And uh, similarly. If you uh, look at look here, when uh, during phi one, this is connected to the sum summation block. Here, the output is not connected, right? So the operations in these two uh, circuits are also not overlapping. So what happens here because of that is this. So let us say I call uh, these voltages as V O one, V O two. Let me just make some space. And say the final output is V out. I'll have two phases. So in phase one, what is V out? Sorry, V O one. That's all. Right? In phase one, only this switch is connected, whereas the other input is grounded. So it only have V O one. And in phase two, V O two. Right? So this is basically different from the old circuit. Where because we have these overlapping clocks, the output at any time instant will be sum of multiple, you know, these voltages, right? Because here you see that uh, this is the first clock and this is the second clock, P of T minus T S by N. In uh, this time phase, you see both the things are active. So here you have to sum up at least these two voltages. Right. Whereas here, even though the output is obtained as sum of two uh, voltages, it's basically just selecting either V O one or V O two, depending on the clock phase. So how how can we simplify the circuit now? So 
will be copy here. So ideally I want V out to be sum of something, right? But in this case, I see that I have V out in phi 1, V out is what? V O1. In phi 2, this V O2. I don't have to add. I just need to select one of these two depending on the clock phase and I could simply do this, right? That's all. And here we already have these switches. So I can simply erase this portion. Right? And uh, this basically is our view. Is that fine? So this basically does the same, right? In phase 5 one, V01 is connected to V out. In phase phi 2, V O2 is connected to V out. Right? Now uh, we can do some more simplifications here. So let me copy this again. So as we just saw the uh, circuits in these two branches, their operation is non-overlapping. So which means when the resistor here is connected to this capacitor, this resistor is not connected, right? And vice versa. So what we can do is, I mean, I don't need to have two resistors. I'll just have one resistor and do it like this, right? Now in phase phi one, this resistor is connected to this capacitor, and in phi two, this is connected here. Okay, and. Turns out we don't have to stop here. So uh, as we saw, V out is what? Uh, v O one in phi one, V O two in phi two. Okay. So uh, look at the circuit and uh, tell me if there is some other node that does the same thing. Sorry, this one. Sorry? This switch? Yeah, yeah. What switch? Yeah, exactly, right? So, if you think about it, this node is basically doing the same, isn't it? If I call this Vx, in phi1, Vx is connected to V1 and basically it's connected to V out like this. In phi2, this is again connected like this. Right? So, uh, I don't need to have a separate connection like this. I'll eliminate it. I'll simply call Vx as my view. Right? Okay, so this is the final circuit. So, let me draw it in a standard form. So, it's just my input. I have the resistor. And I have two branches. It's in both are C and uh, first branch is clock rate phi 1, second branch is clock rate phi 2, and this is my output. So, here this is basically a two path operation. So, what is the I mean, if you have to find the bandwidth, what is the bandwidth here? One sided bandwidth, 1 by 2 RC, because again, each resistor is connected only for half the time. So it's 1 by 2 RC. Okay. Now we don't have to stop here, we can increase uh, this. So let us say you want to make a 4 path filter. So you just take the resistor, and instead of 2 branches, you will have four branches and you need to have uh, four non overlapping clocks so these are phi 1 phi 2 phi 3 phi 4 so let us say phi 1 is this okay. and by the way if i choose n equal to 4 what should be my uh, duty cycle for the clocks 1 4 right only then the clocks will be non-overlap, right? 
So if I call this phi1, phi2 will be shifted by Ts by 4. So it will be like this. So only if you have this one for Ts by 4, which means a duty cycle of 1 fourth, you will have a non overlapping operation. So this is phi3, and this is phi4, and after phi4 falls, this will stop. Okay. And of course, if you have uh, n path, n paths, and this will be called the n path filter. And uh, this n path filter is, uh, I mean, uh, the in the recent five to ten years, the uh, interest in n path filter has grown exponentially, and you will find a lot of works being done in this area. And if you have such an n path filter, if I sketch h0 of j 2 pi f the magnitude of it I will have one band around dc one around fs one around 2, 3 and so on and being an n path system only frequencies of the form f plus k times n f s with alias to f, okay. So, uh, so let us say I uh, am interested uh, at an output frequency which is equal to f s. So basically, output I am interested is f s. So this is also f s. And say I choose n to be eight. Okay. I know that an input at f s will result in an output at f s. So after that, what is the minimum frequency that can uh, fold back to fs at the output. Sorry? Yeah, 9fs, but is there something? Can you think? 7, right? You can put ks minus 1. So then this becomes fs minus 8fs. So being a real signal, if you have 1 at minus 7, you will have a plus 7, right? So the minimum frequency aliasing to fs is now 7fs. And say if I didn't have 8 paths, I just had 1 path, what would be this frequency? You understand? I mean, instead of having 8 paths, I just had the single branch bandpass filter that we were discussing. So, huh? 2fs, right? So, in this case, it will be 2fs. If you just had n equal to 1, that's fine. So now we can clearly see that, I mean these many uh, from 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, you don't have any frequency translations. So you could have a very, you know, uh, shabby bandpass filter that can attenuate all these higher frequencies. Yeah, yeah, this one. So that, two registers, one register. Assumptions, assumptions. No, no assumption, right? I mean, the only assumption is the two clocks are not overlapping. This is important in this case. Yes. I mean, this entire reduction is possible because we have the clock faces to be non overlapping. Else, we'll have to uh, do it like this. So, uh, so by the way, sir, from here to there, uh, what is the advantage that we are taking here? Able to reduce an extra. This one. Yeah, from this yeah, is yeah. also a, this is also an correct. Yeah, the problem is the summation, right? Here you will have to sum all the voltages. But there the summation simply translates to selecting multi, I mean, you know, among multiple outputs. Sum the voltages. Correct. So if you have the problem of summing of voltage. Yeah, that is one of the problems. And plus, I mean, this is much simpler, right? Finally, look at the circuit. Here you will have lot more switches, mm. and you need a you know some summation that needs to exactly sum the inputs without adding any non-linearity, mm. right? So if you choose uh, the clock faces to be non-overlapping, the summation operation simply reduces to selecting among multiple outputs, and that can be done using switches. So, but this is a more general you know n-path.
is not a current. It is not a current. It is a voltage. Yeah, here we'll have so implemented it is like this, right? So, at this current, it will be off. Current will be simple. Exactly. So, what's the issue with some changes or some amplifier? There is no, uh, nothing wrong in that. It just adds to the circuit complexity. Right? Plus, the amplifier must be very linear. See, here if you think about it, the filter doesn't require any op amp, right? It's just purely resistor and capacitor and switches. So the, it's very linear. You are using purely linear elements. So that is one main advantage in the final implementation we have. Right here, you just have all linear blocks. So the filter will have excellent linearity. Okay, great. And uh, if I choose uh, this n path filter, and if I have to have this kind of an implementation. What should be my duty cycle? 1 by n. So the bandwidth will be 1 by nRC. Okay. And yeah, if I were to plot this, this is basically uh, 1 by 2 pi nRC in hertz. Okay. And I mean, this, uh, this is actually very uh, great because. Uh, if you don't have the send pass filter, uh, on chip realizing such a sharp band pass filter is almost impossible. Okay, and such sharp and narrow band pass filters are uh, required in uh, wireless receivers. So, what uh, used to be done is this. Still, uh, that is being done also in some pl many places. So, you have an off chip filter called saw filter. Uh, that saw, saw uh, stands for uh, surface acoustic wave. This is not an electronic filter. This is basically a transducer based filter. So it takes incoming electrical signals, converts to sound or acoustic waves and does something inside. That's the only way to get such narrow and sharp bandpass filters. And this will be an off chip component. You can still find them in your phones. But now, with the uh, introduction of NPATH filters, we have a huge opportunity for designing wireless receivers without this soft filter. And uh, in the recent times, you will find many such solace uh, radio receivers. Okay. Is that fine? Okay, so as a parallel, uh, let's look at this. So let's say I have the input here. I have the resistor, capacitor, and I just take the output here. What is the uh, potential uh, function functionality of this circuit? Sorry, is that something more? This is not a bandpass filter, right? For bandpass, we need to have one more modulation. Yeah, it's a down conversion, right? So. See, uh, if you were to do this, this is a bandpass filter, okay? And I mean, uh, easy way to think is we derived all the circuits starting from this, right? We had a low pass filter, right? Uh, we multiply with zero to one, and then we got this. So if uh, this is a bandpass filter output. Whereas here it's basically a down conversion, right? If you have an input at fs, this will fold back to zero, and the low pass filter will simply allow it here, right? So if you apply an input at fs, the only component that will here you'll have at zero. So the only component that will come out of the low pass filter is dc. Is that fine? Sir, is the same yeah, the, see, it is the same circuit. Okay, if you think about it, if you have to sample a signal, you will just do this. Okay. There, the resistor you will assume to be much smaller. If you have a much smaller resistor, this will simply, in one phase, the switch will be closed. So, the capacitor output will track the incoming signal 
and once this switch is open it will hold the waveform and uh, this is what is called as track and hold but here something more also happens because of the presence of this large resistor you will have some filtering happening but of course you can also use this as a down conversion mixer there is nothing wrong but here you will have additional filtering that's all Correct. No, C. I mean, usually in track and hold, C will be determined by the noise. Yeah. So we want to design. If you want to have a track and hold, you need to have an ideal switch, ideally. So you'll try to make the resistance of the switch as small as possible. Okay, it's all the same thing, right? Resistors, switch, capacitor. If you put them in multiple you know, permutation combination, you can come up with very interesting and useful circuits. Okay, so this everyone is convinced that this basically acts like a mixer if I take the output here. So again, uh, this mixer you can also improve it by having multiple paths. And uh, that is the end path mixer. The circuit is Similar again, you have the resistor. So what you do, you have capacitors like this, and I'll take four path uh, for example. Okay, so this is phi one, phi two, phi three, and phi four. So I'll take the individual capacitor outputs and uh, do processing, and this is basically the end path mixer. And if you think about it, this is exactly identical to the circuit of the n path filter right in the n path filter this was the circuit we had so for the fourth path filter right and we took the output here so this is basically the band pass filter output whereas if you tap the individual capacitor voltages That will be the output of a mixer. Right? So all the individual capacitors will be band pass. Sorry, not band pass. Low pass. Meaning the frequency will be down converted. Yeah, down converted. All the individual capacitors will be down converted. Yeah. Uh, here, here we do not need to add any. Yeah, we'll uh, I'll probably cover it later. We'll have, I mean, uh, we'll have this IQ business, so we'll process each of them individually and do combining later. But all the all the properties of the end part, which is uh, not having multiple, basically having frequency transmission after n n n plus, that will be uh, applicable for each and every capacitor. No, no, we'll have to add, right? We'll have to sum them. Yeah, yeah. I just told you take this and you sum them or do whatever processing you want. If we sum them directly, all the four voltages, then this will have the same. Yeah, this is basically identical to the n pass filter where you sum up. In the for the band pass, we need to need to do that explicitly because it is uh, simply connecting the. Yeah. That is why there we need we need to explicitly add this. Or here also you could do the same thing. Right? Just put it and do it. No, no, not necessarily. Sorry, not actually. So this, uh, remember, uh, when we do the same path operation, each individual circuit is operating at FS. The only thing that we are achieving is the uh, frequency translations are now happening from F plus n times FS. That's all. This is still operating at FS. So you just treat this part as a separate circuit. We can, I mean, if you actually sum up these voltages, you can reduce the down conversions from higher frequencies. That's all. I mean, this uh, used in a slightly different way. Probably I'll uh, cover it later in the course. But I just wanted to, you know, like paint you a basic picture. Okay. 
So uh, now let's take our four path filter as an example and try to understand it slightly better. Okay, so uh, what is the overall periodicity of this network now? To the outside world, how does it look like? As if it is at 4FS. Okay, so let's, uh, and uh, we know that this is basically the four path implementation of this simple looking circuit. Okay, and the duty cycle everywhere is one fourth. Right. So let us say uh, this fellow has harmonic transfer functions hk of j to pi f and I am interested in finding the harmonic transfer functions of this four path filter which is say h k hat of j to pi f. So can you tell me what is h naught h1 hat? All these h naught hat is 4 times h naught of j to pi f h1 we have all these three zero and this is again okay. so if you have to find the harmonic transfer functions for this you can as well just compute the harmonic transfer function of this single uh, path circuit and then we can derive it. So let's quickly do that for a few cases. Okay. So uh, let's say I'm interested in finding h naught hat of j two pi zero. That's basically four times h zero of j two pi zero. So what is h0 of j2 pi 0 in the circuit? h0 of j2 pi 0 in the circuit, right? No, please think carefully. Uh, if I apply a 1 volt DC, what is the capacitor voltage in steady state? 1 volt? 1 volt, right? This will be at say... Yeah, this will be 1 volt. And uh, this is getting multiplied by P of T, which has a duty cycle of 1 fourth. So the output will look like this. Right? So this is 1 fourth. So for H naught hat, it is 1. And it's uh, straightforward to actually look from the circuit also. Let me just take this. Okay. So again I apply a 1 volt DC. So in steady state uh, what are these capacitor voltages? All the capacitors will charge to 1 volt. So the output voltage is obtained by selecting uh, first capacitor voltage in one phase, the second capacitor in other phase and so on. So it will be constant one volt. Right? And that makes sense, right? We had h0 hat of j2 pi 0 to be 1. We take this now. Let's try to find h0 uh, of j2 pi fs. So, I will have to, uh, what should be the input now? Yeah, we will essentially have to apply e power j 2 pi fst and uh, here it easier to, it is easier to do it in two separate experiments. <coughs> so first let us find the response to cos 2 pi fst. Let us say call that yc. 
uh, let's say this is my cost. This is zero TS TS by two and this is TS by four. Okay. Now uh, this is RLC. Now this clock say phi one is active only in this clock phase in this period of time. So the input waveform that is seen by the RC filter is basically only this portion, right? And since our uh, period is exactly equal to the that is the input frequency is exactly equal to the clock frequency in every clock cycle, only the same portion of the cos will be fed to the RC filter. So it will try to uh, and we'll assume that the RC time constant is much much greater than TS by four. And uh, that's reasonable because we wanted the bandwidth, which is one by four RC, to be much much smaller than the center frequency of this. Right? And this basically translates to this. So now we know uh, the RC time constant is very large. So I'll assume that the capacitor voltage is almost constant, and only the DC component is dominating. So what will be the DC of this portion? Sorry, why do you say one by two? Right? No, no. Okay, this is okay, different. Okay, wait. I mean, at least everyone remembers this, right? If I have half sinusoid, okay, it's one by pi. If you have this, right? Because if this is my waveform, sinusoid for half, and then zero for the rest, it's one by pi. If I just take the average of this portion, two by pi, and the signal that we are interested in is basically one half of this, and uh, this portion is basically the mirrored version of this. So both of them will have the same average. Both the portions of the waveform will have the same average, and uh, that should be equal to two by pi, right? If I take the average here, I see some this is some value. I take the average here. That is still the same, right? And the, the overall average is two by two. Okay. Okay. So I know the capacitor voltage. I'll call it V cap. V cap of T is approximately two by two. So uh, the final output I'll call here Y C of T because I applied cos. How does Y C of T look like? Capacitor voltage is constant. That gets multiplied by uh, this square wave that is active for one quarter of the clock period. So it has something like this, right? And this is P at two by two, this height. Okay. And uh, please remember, we had this two by two. And the RC filter was seeing the same section of the cos because our input frequency is equal to Fs. The moment you deviate during each clock period, that is during each phi one, the waveform that the RC filter sees will be very different. Right? For example, let's say uh, this is your some signal. So in one phase, let us say the RC filter looks at this portion of the waveform. In uh, another phase, it might look at say this portion. So it will not build up to one constant voltage, and the final value that to which the capacitor settles to will be much smaller, and that's the reason we had bandpass behavior, right? I give a tone at FS, I see some maximum value. The moment I deviate it, deviate the frequency from FS, it's some very small value. Even if FS will be FS minus delta FS, so then the value will be zero. It won't be zero. Okay. It will be much smaller. Right. So uh, now we know the response for cos. Let's quickly find the response to sine. Let's use this, this again. Uh, 
Correct. So you basically integrate cos 2 pi f s t from 0 to t s by 4, right? That's all. Yeah, sorry. Correct. Divide by t s by 4. Thanks. No. Clock frequency is t s, but the cos, this portion of the waveform is seen by the RC filter for T S by 4. So it is as if, uh, yeah. so uh, this is the circuit now we have. So I can, uh, and we are giving a cos, right. So I can think of it like this, I just have an RC circuit where the input to the uh, RC circuit is basically only one quarter of the cos. Understand. Okay. Uh, Correct. Because the input is connected only for one quarter of the clock period. So only a quarter uh, wave of the cos is being seen by the RC filter. So I mean as long as I am considering only the DC portion, I can uh, say that the circuit is similar to this. Is that fine? So that's why you take only average for uh, TSB. Great. So let's quickly do for sine. Uh, sine is basically shifted version. So so now uh, the portion of the sinusoid that the RC filter sees will be say this quarter. Same, right? So this is same as again Ys of t. Okay. So now we know the response to cos and sine, we can actually find the time varying frequency response h of j 2 pi f s comma t that is basically the response to the cos plus j times y s divided by exponential I will just write it as e power minus j 2 pi f s t and uh, I can write y c I mean basically both yc and ys are same and equal to 2 by pi for one quarter of the period. So I will just say it is uh, 2 by pi times 1 plus j e power minus j 2 pi fst for 0 to ts by 4 and it is 0 for the rest of it. Okay. And we are interested in finding h 0 of j 2 pi fs. Right, that is basically the uh, DC component of this fellow. Okay, uh, this is basically a constant, fine, and we just have to compute the average of this over this period. Fine. This one. Okay. So you only consider one. One yeah. No, oh, no, I am looking at only one path. Okay. The idea was the four path filter is derived based on this. Okay. So, if I know the harmonic transfer function of this, I can quickly calculate the other. Okay. So, now we are only uh, required to find the average of this over this time period. And of course, this has both cos 2 pi fst and the sin 2 pi fst. Okay. And if I have, if I were to sketch the uh, real portion, it is uh, cos for 0 to ts by 4 and 0 for the rest of the time. Right. So it will look like this. So this is 0, this is ts by 4. And this is TS. And we are trying we have to find the average of the entire waveform. Right? And what is the average? And uh, 1 by 2 pi. Right? Because if I had only uh, this fellow averaged over TS by 4, that was 2 by pi. But now we are averaging over TS 4 times larger period, so it's 1 4. And similarly for the sign we have the same, right? So average of this is also 1 by 2. Okay. So uh, the H0 of J2 pi fs 
is basically the scaling factor, right? Uh, 2 by pi into 1 plus j. And copy write it here. 2 by pi into and write it here. Plus the average of cos was 1 by 2 pi minus j times j pi. So what does it simplify to? You know, 1 by pi square times 1 plus j into 1 minus j. That's basically 2 by pi square. Okay. So this is 2 by pi square for the 4 path uh, filter then the h 0 hat of j 2 pi fs is how much? 4 times this so 8 pi pi square. Okay. So uh, let's also actually look at the 4 path filter and see what happens when you apply this cos and sine. So let us say again here I am applying cos 2 pi fst now directly to this 4 path filter. So this is the cos this is t, this is t s by 4. Okay. So phi 1 is active here, phi 2 is active here. and 5 okay. So again we have chosen the frequency to be exactly equal to the clock frequency. So uh, the first capacitor is active during phi 1. It will see this portion of the waveform every time. The second capacitor is connected during phi 2. That will see basically this portion of the waveform every time. And the uh, I have chosen phi 1 Third capacitor sees this portion and say the fourth capacitor sees this. Fine. And uh, since this is the waveform, the capacitor sees every clock cycle in steady state, the capacitor voltage will be equal to the average of the waveform, which is what is it? 2 by pi. Right? And the output voltage is basically uh, selecting each of the capacitor outputs in every clock phase. So in phase 1 we will select the first capacitor voltage which is 2 by pi. In the second phase we will uh, select the second capacitor voltage which is the average of this that is minus 2 by pi. The third phase it is again minus 2 by pi and here it will. So this is basically our YC of P right, for the 4 path filter directly. If you recollect for the uh, single path, we just had uh, something like this, right? Only this portion we will compute. So let me do for sign also. So I will just uh, do this, I just push it here. Phi 2, phi 3, and phi 4. So, how will the waveform look like? So, it will be 2 by pi here, here also 2 by pi, and uh, in the other half cycle it will be minus 2. So, this is ys of p. So, let us uh, actually calculate the uh, h of j2 pi, this is h hat of j2 pi of this comma t. This is directly for the 4 path case. Okay. And this is again yc plus j times ys times c power minus j2 pi plus t. And unlike for the single path case, uh, it is difficult to get a closed form expression because yc is doing something and ys is behaving in a slightly different way. So let us draw the waveforms that might be easier. 
I'll first expand this. Uh, this is basically cos minus j sin. So we'll have yc times cos plus ys times sin. This is the real portion and j times ys cos minus yc sin. And uh, let's quickly sketch how each of these look like. I know this is yc of t. Okay. The first term is uh, yc times cos. Okay, so cos will look like this. Okay. I have to uh, take the product of these two. So during this phase, yc is positive. So we'll have the uh, same portion of the cos, right? And uh, here, yc is negative. So this portion will get flipped. Okay, so we'll have this. And after this, it is again positive. I will just have the same portion. The only difference is the scaling factor is 2 by 5. Uh, so let's do ys times sin also. Let us see other portion. This is ys of t. And sin looks uh, like this. First half. It's positive, so the sine wave uh, comes directly. In the second half, the sine wave gets flipped. Right? Again, the amplitude is 2 by 2. This is 3 and this is 2 by 2. Okay. So, to get the real part, I'll have to sum up these two waveforms. So, first let me draw. This is one part. And the other one look like this. Okay. Now, actually, from this we can directly get the average, right? So everything is scaled at two by five. What is the average of uh, this waveform? Four by pi square, right? It is basically. I mean, if this had an amplitude of one, we have the same portion everywhere. Average is two by pi. Now it's scaled by uh, two by pi, so it's four by pi square. What about this? Same, right? This is also 4 by pi square. Okay. So the total average is 4 by pi square. And of course, if you actually plot uh, these two, uh, sum up these two and plot, so the sum, uh, how it look? So this is minimum, so this is 0. So the sum starts at this point. And here it will be like this. Right? And basically, whenever this goes to zero, here it gets a bit nicer. And you can clearly see this waveform is periodic cut. What is the period? Ts by 4, right? So, uh, the overall this waveform is periodic at Ts by 4. And sort of explains the four path operation. I gave a tone at Fs, and I will be seeing, you know, uh, at 4 Fs. Okay, uh, and uh, similarly, you can also find this fellow. So since since we have some ten minutes, we'll do that also. What do you think the average of this will be now? It should be zero, right? The actual value is eight by pi square. The real term already gave it, so this has to be zero. So let's uh, check that. Uh, this is ys times cos and ys was looking like this okay. and the cos does something like this. So if I take the product of the two, uh, during this portion, I will have the same thing coming and when it is negative, 
This portion will get flipped over. There will be a sudden jump. Then we we'll have. So now what is the average of this waveform? Zero, right? I have both positive and negative is equal. And uh, similarly, if I were to plot yc, yc, this is basically ys times cos. So here I have plotted ys, sorry, it's yc. So sine looks like this. So again, I'll have to take the product. This portion, it's positive, so I'll have the waveform repeated. Here it's negative, so this portion of the waveform will get flipped over. So I'll have something like this. And finally, I have again positive, so this portion will directly come. And again, you can clearly see we have equal areas for positive and negative, so average is zero. So the overall h zero is same by square. So like this, you can calculate all the other harmonic transformations. So let's stop here.